Stay hungry. Stay foolish. The Innovation Show is brought to you by Zai Boldly, transforming the future of financial services with a suite of embedded products and services, enabling businesses to move funds with ease and manage multiple payment workflows. You can check out Zai at hellozai.com. We welcome back the author of Framers Make Better Decisions in the Age of Big Data, Kenneth Kukie. Welcome back to the show. I'm so pleased to be back. It's great to have you back. And this time you're coming to us live from your office in The Economist. I thought we'd start with something that framing is, which is it is a cognitive muscle that we can strengthen to, to improve our lives, our work and our future. And I thought we'd start with a way to actually build that muscle. And you say here, to use frame successfully, you tell us three elements are in play, causal thinking, our aptitude to create counterfactuals, and our capacity to constrain and shape our imagination toward a particular goal. There's a lot in there. But I'd love you to share these three as a starting point. Yeah, absolutely. So as you pointed out, the, the, when we frame, which we're doing all the time, we are basically, we have a mental model of how the world works, and we are interacting with the world based on that mental model. And the revolution that's taken place in the last basically two decades in cognitive science is that we recognize that that element of the mental model, of the frame that we have that we're often not conscious of, we can actually stop ourselves and become very conscious of, become very deliberate in how we choose to see the world and what frame we actually have. And we can modify the frame or we can change the frame. We can change it by adapting a new frame or in very rare instances, we can reframe altogether and, have, and, and create a new frame. But let's leave that part of the story to later. Because what you're asking about is, well, what is a frame? What are the components of a frame? And there's three of them. As you point out, it's causality, counterfactuals, and constraints. So let's think of all three and see how they work. So the first one is causality. It's a basic sense of cause and effect. It is a general understanding of how the world works. Children, babies, as young as six months and a year, have a implicit sense of causal reasoning in their minds. We know this through, they can't even speak, but we know this through eye tracking studies in which we see that a baby's a baby, when they see a dropped object, they will expect it to fall down. Hence, they understand gravity. They don't understand why it is. They don't understand what it is. They don't have a term for it. They can't speak. They don't even have like a neural cortex that they have actually like memories forming, but they do understand that there is such a thing as gravity in the world, that there is cause and effect. And that, that is important because it makes the world predictable. And that's maybe the essence of the causal nature of how we implicitly interact with the world. It doesn't have to be correct for it to be useful. So for example, we often believe that um, if we don't bundle up in the winter, um, we might catch a cold. And so our parents would tell us that we have to wear a scarf, we have to wear a hat. And it turns out that there's a lot more to catching the bug and, and, and getting a cold than just simply wearing warm clothing, although that's not such a bad thing to do. But the fact is that even if we're wrong, we still benefit by having a world that is just not constantly unpredictable, but one where we have basic predictability and therefore we can have action within the world. The second one is counterfactuals. Frames have a inherent nature sense of counterfactual reasoning. What that is, is just simply playing the game of life two ticks ahead at every moment, anticipating what the world might, might come about, and therefore responding to it. We do this all the time without even thinking twice. A strange example of that would be this. I remember when I was about, um, when I was a new parent, and I was with uh, maybe a, my two-year-old, and we were uh, walking down at a, at a almost like skipping at a quick pace a a wet asphalt sort of driveway and as she's doing it she is going towards a manhole cover that's closed it's just a metal manhole as we're doing it and of course we as adults already know it's going to be more slippery than the asphalt but she doesn't and sure enough without me thinking twice about it she slips falls starts crying now I think about this because it was so 
because I could see it in slow motion from an out-of-body experience. She had no basis to know this, but of course I did. But And it goes to the fact that all throughout the world, at every moment, we're constantly predicting the world of what's going to happen and then taking action around it. Um, our, our papers don't blow away because we hold it a little bit more tightly when the tube swings by because we know it's going to create a rush of air. Things that we can't even articulate. Thousands of predictions a second we're making and we're calibrating our lives for. Now, what's important is that in a frame, we can actually reimagine the world, a different world, a different universe, dream up or reconceptualize how the world might be. And that act of imagination, that act of creation, to use a term, is extraordinarily important. We don't know of any other animal that can do that. We don't know of, we know some people are better at it than others. We know that people who have brain damage don't have that ability to do that, to think ahead. We know where in the brain it happens in the prefrontal cortex. This is an essential feature of how we inter- how we live our lives and interact. And importantly, machines can't do that, right? They, w- they wouldn't have the meaningful ways of creating future worlds. I mean, if we stop and think about it, it is as important as that. We, we live in one world. Yet we can, with our mind's eye, create a future world. We can live in that future world. We can interact with that future world. We can do things there. We can prepare there. And then we can bring it back into our own world. That is the essence of innovation and entrepreneurship, right? Seeing the world not as it is, but as it could be, and imagining how you would interact in that world and what you would need to do to bring that world into fruition. In the political sphere, that could be Marxism. Um, In the economic sphere, it could be Marxism too, but it could also be Adam Smith. Adam Smith was, in 1776, was not so much defining the world as it was, but creating a new frame that was leaving mercantilism behind and creating capitalism, in which the purpose of the economy wasn't simply to make money, but to use that self-interest for a social good through competition and serving other people. Wealth of Nations was one of three books that he was writing. He never wrote the third one. The first one was Theory of Moral Sentiments. He was a moral philosopher. And I should also add, when Adam Smith talked about free markets, he didn't mean free markets as in free from regulation. He meant free from tithes and free from rents from rentiers who basically pickpocket the public purse or the public. Okay. So it's, so it's, it's totally distorted today when we think of neoliberalism and, and, and economics and Adam Smith. Adam Smith was like, in fact, interestingly enough and relevantly, the one economist that Karl Marx really had time for and thought very highly of was Adam Smith. Okay. So, so that's counterfactuals, playing the game of life two ticks ahead, reimagining all, you know, future worlds, and, and how we would need to interact with it. Now, these, these imaginings and these sort of few, these alternative realities that we're creating, these counterfactuals, can't just be willy-nilly. For example, if I wanted to create a, um, a, a new rocket that could take us to long-haul space travel, what I can't do is just simply imagine that gravity doesn't exist. There needs to be constraints to them. We need to find meaningful constraints. Now, What's important is that some of these constraints are hard constraints that we can't change. Gravity is one. Some of these constraints are actually soft constraints or malleable constraints that actually, if you think about it differently, aren't really constraints at all. So let me give you an example of what I mean by that. Um, When NASA was looking for a reusable rocket uh, in the 1960s and 70s, and they started you know, b- creating the process of thinking about how instead of taking a rocket, putting it up and having all of the pieces just fall back to earth and into the water, which was very expensive and, and wasteful, they thought, well, what can we do? And they lo- looked at lots of different op- options. One was to actually do what was what was in a classic science fiction movie by Jules Verne in which the rocket would land itself back, one of the stages of the rocket where the, where the, where the, the fuel was. That was deemed to be just absolutely impossible. You couldn't get the aerodynamism. You couldn't get the control mechanism that way. So what they looked at was basically taking the actual spaceship itself and putting wings on it 
it was very unglamorous and it was almost like a bumblebee, which is to say it in theory, it shouldn't work. It was very wasteful as well. It was a very imperfect compromise. Elon Musk comes around and that was the spaceship challenger. Okay. So, and, and, and the shuttle, I should say. So, uh, so the shuttle has a, has a nice history for about 20 years from 80 to 2000, a little bit later, 2005 or so. And, um, Elon Musk comes around 2010 and says, no, 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 no. Like, we could actually take the rocket and we could actually land it. That's not impossible. The constraint that people had no longer exists. We now have extraordinarily good microcontrollers. We have computers, right, who can make these micro adjustments. And we have incredibly good understanding of spatial positioning through GPS. If I add all these new technologies together, this is a soluble problem. And sure enough, it was. And I think it's awe-inspiring to see the Falcon rocket first lift off and then to land on its landing pad after it has brought a capsule up to space. So it's to show that the, that by reframing the problem and recognizing that there are certain constraints, laws of physics, but also some constraints that are no longer constraints because the environment has changed, in this case, technology, we can actually reframe our problems or adapt our frames and then solve our problems that way. So the constraints are really important. And what we what what really bad people don't know, really bad, really bad entrepreneurs and innovators and and real dunderheads don't like constraints because they feel that it limits them and it limits their boundaries. But extraordinarily good artists and creators and innovators love constraints. Constraints are their friends because it forces you to well, it forces you to innovate. You become much more creative and, and you solve different problems by imposing constraints. And I'll, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll share one small example with that. When I was given over, I was given a section um, several years ago of The Economist, and it was something new that we hadn't done before. It was with, using digital media with a team of reporters and a team of editors and designers to do things. And I realized oh man, we've got a big problem. Like this, there's just blue sky thinking everywhere and this is going to end really badly. So the first thing I did is I imposed lots and lots and lots of constraints on ourselves. First example, we're going to do these video graphics. Okay. Um, the, I, the, I, we did a few, they did really well. There, there was some that, there was parts of it that I liked, parts of it that I didn't. But then I realized, no, 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 no. I've, I've got to say that they can never ever under any condition exceed 60 seconds it has to be 60 seconds suddenly time became the most germane factor in everyone's life and that was beautiful because you realize there's things you you don't need to do if you have to always shrink the time that you have to do the video graphic so the first thing that then became pretty obvious is if you're showing the movement of variables on screen you don't need to say the the variable the, the the variables that are moving people can see it they're using one form of their perception their visual one they don't need the audio version of it as well that's a small example but it's to say by imposing all of these constraints suddenly we started doing really interesting things things that we never even imagined that we could do now in writing the book it gave me a wonderful opportunity to plow through the history of a lot of great innovators, whether it was an architect who has to sort of, Frank Geary, who has to think in new constraints. And he says the hardest project he ever had to work on was one in which a, a benefactor said that there was no constraints. There was just, there's no limits to what he could do. The sky was limit. He said he felt paralyzed. He says when he has these constraints, he can then innovate into them. Dr. Seuss's great book, Green Eggs and Ham, the, the childhood classic that people remember, uh, was born of the fact that his publisher went to him and challenged him, made a bet, a $100 bet, that he couldn't write a book with only 50 one-syllable words. And Dr. Seuss, Theodore uh, Geisel, Seuss was his middle name, who was a very good author at the time and also designer, he hated this idea. He just, he just, everything about this, he bristled. He felt it was unrealistic. It was ridiculous. He didn't like to have this sort of imposed on him. He thought it was a useless thing. The theory was that, for, and it's a legitimate theory, for child reader books, when you have a, uh, when you have just one syllable words and 50 words, 
it's very it's much easier for the child to understand and learn language and get that language acquisition and it's a little bit more entertaining as well and if the words repeated it actually is helpful for their for their memory and their cognitive reasoning so there was a very there's a very legitimate and, and largely accurate uh pedagogical reason for why you would only want 51 syllable words anyway geisel hates the idea but he loves the bet and he hates the fact that his publisher is going to get you know 100 quid so he says you know what 100 dollars he says i'm doing it and he does it and he creates you know Green Eggs and Ham, the, the classic book. You can read it on a boat. You can read it with a goat. So the uh, uh, Martha Graham is another example of loosening one constraint at the time when she sort of created modern dance. Uh, women who, it was typically ballet at the time and there was not the form, but women were typically bound tight in corsets. So she, she freed, literally liberated women and liberation is an important element of her of her dance because, of course, now the body was able to do things that it that it wasn't able to do before when it was bound up tight, and so women were being liberated. This around the 1920s and 30s when women women's liberation was happening in lots of spheres in society, in terms of um, women were able to drink, women were able to smoke, women were able to live in boarding houses if they were not in, at homes, and they were able to go out with men, right? Um, often with a chaperone, but not always. So. It was to show that there was this liberation happening in all dimensions and dance was one part of it. So she created this liberation by getting rid of the corset, but then she imposed huge constraints on the dancers, what was called the, 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 the Martha Graham method, which is a breathing method of how the body goes and how you breathe, inhale and exhale at certain times so you can make certain movements. Now, the constraints... <laughs> <laughs> last to this day, even though dear Martha Graham is dead, because actually dance, dance companies that want to use the Martha Graham method are not allowed to unless they license the intellectual property of the trademark Martha Graham method. So there's actually a constraint ironically there as well. But the larger point is this, when we are in a frame, we have causal reasonings about the world on one hand, we have counterfactuals on the other in terms of how the world can be. And then we put these meaningful constraints on our counterfactuals so that they're relevant and they're meaningful and they're actionable. And together now, we can actually see the world one way or choose to see the world another way. And that's when we're framing what's going on. Beautiful, beautiful, man. And it's, I just want to bring it back to innovation or to any type of new creation is this is a framework to use to frame the world and and it's so useful it's almost like diverge converge let's imagine what's possible but then bring it back to what's actually feasible within the possibility let me just give a little wing a zinger to to build on what you've just said which is that the there is this perception that we should do brainstorming right and the view is widely is around in fact we know the origin of brainstorming at a Manhattan uh, advertising agency that coined the term for brainstorming and, and what the purpose of it was. And the idea was that all ideas should be accepted and that there's no such thing as a bad idea and that you should just sort of throw anything out there. Now, it turns out that in, in 1950s America, um, where you had hierarchy and, uh, and you had a lot of other um, sort of pathologies of office culture, Brainstorming in that limited context might have been a good thing to get pe smart people uh, uh, who are younger and, and maybe from the wrong schools to speak up. But typically, brainstorming does not work. Uh, that you that that the ideas that are generated in that context are often um, just pretty useless. Gets to the idea that many people think that ideas are very valuable, and it turns out that. That's just not true. Ideas are incredibly cheap because most ideas are bad ideas. Good ideas are valuable. And those good ideas are very rare. And often they need those constraints, those meaningful constraints, because just ideas for ideas sake is actually quite um, useless. And there's a lot of sociological research that shows that when you ask people to do a lot of blue sky thinking and to quote unquote think outside the box, their ideas worsen, they perform worse, they're less satisfied, and the output is shite. Now, um, thinking outside the box, which we delve into in the book, 
um, because we look at it from the from the academic literature thinking outside the box, is the biggest canard of how we think of innovation. Because to go back to Elon Musk and to go back to the constraints, the constraints are your friend, right? You're always in a box. You're always in a frame, and you can never leave the frame. And when you try to think without constraints, when you try to think outside the box, you're it's simply, you just can't do it. First, you can't do it, so it's useless. But secondly, every time you try to do it, the the research is completely damning that you actually perform worse and the ideas are less good. So you shouldn't try to do that. What you should do is be conscious of the box you're in. And if you need to, adapt the box or change boxes altogether. I work in this area, I work with companies to do this. And I often put the constraint and go, Okay, what, what are we working on? And there's kind of going, we're, we're brainstorming as like, on, but what are we working on? And there's, there's too often, and it's different frames. It's, it's to the point of the book as well as like, they're seeing it, well, it's a creativity exercise. I don't go, ah, but that's a different thing than actually working on something to get a specific output. If it's just creativity, then that's call it a creativity session. But there's another thing, and I'd, I'd love your opinion on it, is that, well, brainstorming often puts introverts on the spot. And one of the things I, I try to do is, is, I call it quiet storming, is where you send the brief to the team who are going to innovate ahead of the time, or at least touch base with them. Because you don't want people to be caught off guard because then they come full of fear to those sessions and they don't open up. Completely. I mean, that, that it, it turns out that um, whether you knew it or not, uh, the sociological and, uh, and psychological cognitive psychology research is very clear that that is actually the way to do it. Give people the brief and let them think about it ahead of time and have them write it down and bring it in and then to all share it at the same time. Now, there's several reasons for that. The first one is it gets independent thinking. Once we're all together and we start thinking, we're not independent. Secondly, once we're all together and we start and we're thinking together, if we hadn't done that, what happens is, if you will, management by hippo. And hippo stands for highest paid person's opinion. It's a classic aphorism. But the but the research looking at this predates the, the 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 coining of that term, which is around 2010 or so at Google. So what it is is that there is these hierarchies in the office, and we all are just like monkeys in the jungle or in the Serengeti, in which we sort of look for the alpha, and when the person speaks, we all sort of align around that. And the problem is that we lose the cognitive diversity that could exist in the group of people coming up with different problems. And their, their answers may not be actually the answer, but it starts the climb at a different spot. And then other people can build on it. So it's really essential. And the way to do this, and Danny Kahneman, in Thinking Fast and Slow, makes a very good case for why this is the way to do it, to manage the cognitive diversity is have the different participants think through a problem and write it down independently, go into the meeting and share it, and then start discussing it. Suddenly, there's an affirmation effect that someone has put out, have had no choice, even if they're the introvert, put out an idea that then has to be discussed as a group. And it, it limits the, the, the idea of, I think, the meetings that we've all been in, where the leader of the group innocently makes a remark and then everyone goes into order and anyone who has an idea that is slightly different than that now doesn't have the courage to speak up now the, the second point that that you've identified which is a problem is that if we don't do it this way what happens is the person who is the most ext extrovert um and maybe the biggest braggart right and the person with maybe the worst ideas but just the loudest mouth squeaky wheel gets the grease is the person who sets the agenda, who says something out there that everyone then has to respond to. And then we spend the entire time discussing why this is a good idea, but we sort of like the guy or we don't want to hurt his feelings. So we start sort of seeing how we could make this idea slightly work. I was in one meeting, the most, I've been in a lot of atrocious meetings in my life doing these sorts of things, but one in particular stands out in which um, the, the person says, wants us all in about a two minute period, four minute, come up with an idea of a new media product for The Economist of how we would do it. 
And so in, in basically maybe a five minute period, we have to sketch out an idea. Now, what do you think everyone does? Like they sketch out the idea that they've been, they've been noodling for the last five hours or more likely the last five years, right? Or two years that they've been talking about and all that because these are the creative digital people of the paper. And so they just come up with that old thing that was just lingering in the recesses of their mind put out there. And then we're supposed to discuss it as in groups. And then we're supposed to present it in others. Um, so it goes five minutes, five minutes, five minutes. So suddenly in the first 15 minutes of the day, we have mediocre ideas that are being announced as a group. And now as an entire group, we have to choose one and discuss how this we can make this happen. So we have first mediocre ideas from people who were just the boldest to come up with their mediocrity, who then were now imprisoned in a meeting, spending hours discussing a ridiculous idea that is just banal and, and not, particularly, not particularly original and not particularly good and not going to be effective for us. We've all been in situations like that. And it's and we need to sort of defang the monster of how innovation works. The and what one way that I try to do that as a leader in thinking through how we can sort of bring teams to think afresh about problems is I started a meeting years ago, very similarly, asking everyone to write down their ideas on a certain topic. I gave them five or ten minutes. Um, to sort of put it, you know, the problem that we had and to come up with what their idea was. I collected the pieces of paper just in the bullet points. I looked at them all with, with another colleague who knew I was what I was doing. So I had some sort of air cover. And I said, okay, these are, these are all very interesting ideas. Today, we are not going to talk about them. If you bring up what you wrote down, you're out. Because I see what they are. You're out. You're not allowed to bring it up. Right. If someone independently comes up with it, well, let's see what happens. But the point is, like your previous way of thinking, your previous mental model about what to do about this, you are not allowed to bring it. We're going to be here to actually think afresh together by coming up with ideas that we've not thought about before and developing them in ways that are unpredictable. And we're going to see what happens. Now, the result, of course, was we created a new product that created $100 million in revenue, and we we're very successful. That's a complete lie. Of course, it's a lie. It's ridiculous. You can't simply do that and think it's going to be successful. Sometimes it is. So more often, it's not. Was it successful? No. Right. That didn't matter. Right. The point is, I mean, there was other benefits of it. We became cohesive as a team. We thought we had a better understanding of the problem. It was one accretive step in a long journey in terms of changing our digital strategy. And if we did come up with the solution, first, that that's very rare. You often don't. But if it did, maybe it wasn't that hard a problem. Right. The bigger point is that it was part of this wave of what we did to actually solve our problems. And and more often than not, the, you're not going to sort of bring people together and sort of immediately solve the problem. And we didn't. And that that was fine, too. But the good news is that it was a new way of thinking about how we're going to solve our problems by forcing. And this is before I even we, this years ago before the book Framing and before I thought about the power of mental models. That they forced us to to accept that there is a way that we see the world, and in and today in this instance, I'm not going to bring that in. I'm going to just I'm going to be more humble, and a little bit more cast out adrift at sea, where I don't see land, and I'm bobbing, and that's uncomfortable. But I can accept that because we're all in that state together, and maybe through the new way of thinking together and learning new things and hearing things for the first time, so to speak. I'll see things in a new way. Oh, I love it. I love it. Man. <laughs> you had me on the $100 million product. I was like, wow. <laughs> I but wish. I was thinking about uh, a couple of things about constraints in particular. One was because you mentioned the time when you were hopping, skipping along and the manhole cover. I was like, oh, please don't let that manhole cover be open. Was <laughs> but uh, on another note, I, I was thinking about children and one of the theories I heard I read about the terrible twos, and I'll need to revisit it is that the child is really testing the boundaries. And if there's no pushback from the parent to kind of go, ah, ah, you can't do that. The child actually feels less loved and less cared for and actually it creates a stress. And I often think about that 
from a job spec perspective or for innovation one innovation team i worked with they were given unlimited budget to work and i was like going on oh no this is terrible because when you're given that unlimited blank space it, it can be stressful because you're like going, well i'll shoot just loads of loads of ideas and hope something will stick and then i thought okay how can i think about that and map it to what can examples concrete examples you give in the book of which there's many you mentioned some of them one that i'd love you to share which was absolutely fascinating example which had real world consequences which what this book is about was dan shamron and the hostage rescue situation that was a fascinating example he gave thank you oh yeah that that was a a, d- a delight to report so uh dan shamron was a uh, was a lieutenant general uh, brigadier general, in fact, uh, in the Israeli army in 1976, when uh, he was called into the Ministry of Defense and told that hostages were taken from a uh, from a uh, Air France flight, and that the flight had been flown to Uganda to Entebbe Airport, where the hostages were being taken off the plane, put into a terminal, and that was wired told to be wired with explosives, and that unless uh, Israel was to free uh, its own uh, prisoners um, uh, that had been t- uh, terrorists, that, um, that all the hostages would be killed one by one. Okay, so uh, Israel had a, um, had a policy of not negotiating with terrorists, many countries did and do, and so they didn't know what to do about it. They knew that they had a little bit of time, and if they could think of a plan. So Shamron and others get together and they think, what can we do? He hears that there's already a bunch of plans in the works, right? One of the plans is to um, to fly in uh, looking like it's a prisoner swap um, and then have the Israelis come out, military come out and, 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 and then sort of a- attack. He realizes that's not going to work at all. Another one, another plan is to have um, uh, a, a commandos fly in a cover of night, um, do a, a, a night jump into um, the, um, the the Nile and to uh, into a, a lake right by the airport, and uh, open up some zodiacs, inflate the rafts, paddle to shore, and go in and attack. And although this, in theory, sounds like it's okay, there's two problems with it. The first one is it's easy actually to get into Uganda. How do you get out? Okay, that's that's a pretty important consideration. But the second one is they have some Israeli uh, uh, intelligence agents who happen to be nearby um, drive in. And actually, every country has things like this. People who are sort of um, uh, gracious supporters of their of their intelligence communities um, go in. So it might be a, a, a you know a, a business person or something like this, but is somehow affiliated. And so they drive in to the area around the airport and they, they see hundreds upon hundreds of these massive crocodiles. So the Nile crocodile is there, which is about you know, uh, 200, meters, uh, 200 uh, centimeters long to two meters. These massive, heavy things that are man-eating and hungry. And he realizes that as soon as these commanders are gone, they're going to be eaten before they make it to shore. So that's not going to work either. So instead, they come up with, they think of lots of different plans, they come up with these counterfactuals, but then they need to impose constraints on it, and that's the point. And so the way they did that is they come up with a plan, it turns out that the the company, the construction company that built the terminal where the hostages are being kept is an old terminal that's no longer used at Entebbe Airport, and it was built by an Israeli construction company. So the first thing they do is they say, Get us the blueprints, and within hours, the blueprints of the of the terminal is there. Then it turns out that a few people who had been non-Jewish had been released. So he says, "Great, they get they're, they're in Paris, and so they fly there and they find out how many terrorists there were, their age, their gender, their physical strength, the armaments that they have, and so they have a little bit more information that they can now go on and that they can actually um, base a plan on." And so what they then do is they create a model of the old terminal. And it still doesn't help them in terms of what they're going to do, but they realize what they can do is this. 
they can fly in a big cargo plane that is normally supposed to arrive as one of the last flights in the evening from Germany, a Lufthansa plane. What they have to very quietly do is when the Lufthansa plane is supposed to take off, for it not to take off. And then in the airspace will be the same make, like a DC-4 of this plane coming in. It's a big, massive, hulking cargo plane. But in fact, it's not the cargo plane normally that they have inside the cargo plane, although it's the same one with the same markings and a pilot that probably speaks German, although English is the language, as they fly down inside is going to be the Israeli commandos. There's also going to be other planes that they can then land, that they can then bring the rescue the hostages and then go out. There's actually another plane that lands nearby in Kenya that is just simply a mobile surgical unit for the purpose of having casualties, which they have to predict and, and do. And they, of course, can't tell the Kenyans that they're doing this until basically minutes before the plane lands. So what they then do is they realize, I'm talking about constraints, is what happens when you land? What you can't do is have a bunch of Israeli soldiers burst out because suddenly you're going to be involved in a gunfight. So they think a bit more cleverly and they think, okay, when senior Idi Amin is the dictator of Uganda, and when senior Ugandan officials, including Idi Amin, go in, they typically have their black Mercedes with their Ugandan flags. So they find out what is the model and year of the Mercedes that Idi Amin uses. So it looks like it's a natural Ugandan official coming through with other Ugandan military vehicles and soldiers in Ugandan military outfits. Okay, they do this. They get a tailor in Israel, in Tel Aviv, to, to quickly, this all happening in the space of 24 hours, sew and make Ugandan military army uniforms and helmets so that all of the soldiers can be disguised. They find the right model Mercedes in Israel. Like you can imagine how the conversation goes in which these intelligence Mossad agents come and they say, hello, we'd like to talk to you. We need your car. But no, no, like we need it. We're taking your car right now. I don't care what it's going to cost. We're going to pay you. We don't have any money right now. We will be good for it. We're taking your car. We need your keys. Thank you very much. Sadly, it turns out that the car is white. So they have to paint it black, but they get them the, 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 um, the flags on the hoods and they get the right, the license plate. Everything now is perfect. And, the, and sure enough, the moment comes and they've trained in a model of the, uh, of the of the old terminal, and they've got their plan, and their plan is to open up the cargo doors, and then very slowly and very naturally, speed at a, at a reasonable pace, without hurried in a hurried way, towards there as if it looks like it's a it's an evening inspection of a senior Ugandan official, and sure enough, that's what they do, and all is going to plan, except at the last minute. As they go from the airfield to the part of the terminal in which there's the civilian, where's the vehicles, a guard raises his rifle. Now, it's still in dispute why, what was going on. And I should say, the fog of war is one in which there's always a lot of uncertainty about things, and we have to accept that. I studied this very closely, reading all of the accounts that I could, as well as interviewing one of the commandos on the raid. So as far as I can see, it's not clear whether the person was simply giving a rifle salute or was raising it. I tend to think that it was a natural rifle salute. I don't think that the person was suspicious and was raising it. I think that there's a lot of reason to think that a guard at midnight uh, in an airfield is not going to see a team of vehicles coming at him and immediately be suspicious that this is going to be a raid. More likely, he just is just a loser because you know, you're in the military, right? And you're working at midnight on an airstrip, um, and you just and you you're sort of you're trained to sort of stand at attention and raise your rifle as if you're sort of doing some work. So anyway, he does that, but the but the the lead leader of the team, uh, uh, Johnny Netanyahu, who is the brother of the future prime minister Benjamin Netanyahu, and of course he, Benjamin Netanyahu made his uh, political fortunes on the back of having a brother who had been such a hero, the leader of the Antebi raid, he takes out his pistol and he shoots. Uh, the crack of gunfire wakes up the soldiers in the barracks. 
the element of surprise, which was the key constraint that they were working around. They had to keep the element of constraint of surprise. All the other constraints turned out to be malleable, right? How you get in, all of that. But how do you have this element of surprise? Suddenly that's lost. Lights flick on, sirens start wailing. They come racing now at full speed to the terminal. As soon as the soldiers jump in front of the plate glass window of the terminal, because of course that's the office plate glass windows to do it, they've got their lights, it's dark inside, they can't see from the glare, the people inside the terrace can see them perfectly, and suddenly the plate glass window is destroyed, is shattered into small little bits as the spurt of machine gun fire aiming at them tears across where they are. It's like in, that, it's like in Pulp Fiction, where they stop short and they realize no one's been hit. Like they don't understand how that could have happened, but they know what to do. And they're in on it because they've been training all their lives for this moment. And Israeli commanders, because of some botched hostage rescue attempts several years earlier, are now the most fiercest and thoughtful fighting force in terms of how to handle terrorist situations to protect the hostages and kill the terrorists. So they go to school. And so <laughs> when they realize that no one has been hit, poor Benjamin, uh, Johnny Netanyahu, however, ha sadly had been hit and he's later going to die from his wounds. But for all the other commandos, they knock off the, the terrorists one by one. They go in there, they find it, they get, and they make sure all of the hostages stay down while they actually find out where the terrorists are and, and take care of them. And suddenly now, They've got to get them out. It turns out that the things that you learn from interviewing the people is that there's part of the story that isn't really well known, which is that all of the civilian hostages are in such a state of shock that although they have just basically minutes to get them from the terminal about 100 meters to maybe 200 meters to the planes, everyone, it's midnight for them. They're 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 sort of terrorized. They're in shock. They've got this like post-traumatic stress disorder. Actually, it's not even post-traumatic. It's just this tr they're in this trauma that it's like slow motion. None of them are moving. They're in this weird sort of lethargy where it's taking them minutes to get them just to take steps and to go. Interestingly enough, one of the things that they had brought was a ribbon that they could tie up to the plane and then extend out to the people so that they could go like this so you could lose them. They bring them all onto the plane. They count them. They realize the count doesn't work. They recount them. They recount them again to make sure they get the right count. I mean, this is what happens in the middle of a conflict where right? you just, where shit happens, right? So when they find out that they actually, they do have all the people that they're there to rescue, they load up the planes, they bring up the hoods, they, they have a, a small little team before, outside the plane uh, uh, that basically sent these missile launch or shoulder mounted firearms to knock off the uh, Ugandan Air Force MiGs just as a little parting goodbye kiss to Idi Amin by destroying the Ugandan Air Force. They jump into the planes and the planes take off. There was not a single casualty among the hostages. There was only one among the commandos, sadly, the leader, Netanyahu. And then they fly back, all the way back to Tel Aviv. And on July 4th, 1776, as Americans are waking up to celebrate the 200th anniversary, the bicentennial of, of the U.S., uh, of the United States of America and the country, so too uh, the world is waking up to realize that Israel has pulled off one of the most audacious hostage rescue missions that has ever happened in the history of the world, in which they have flown thousands of miles from their home country rescued with what was known as the long arm of the Israeli military, which was a concept that they had been preparing for, but it never exercised, was able to rescue all their hostages and bring it back. And from that moment on, that was when the beginning of the Israeli military as a very tough fighting force willing to defend Israeli interests if it was being threatened began. And a lot of people were relieved to see that there was a sense of justice in a world of, of evil the hostage takers among them had been mostly German, and the idea of German spilling Jewish blood was something that in 1776, in 1976, you know, 25 years, 30 years after the war, the world just didn't have the stomach for. Uh, it was, there was a sense of a sort of divine justice behind. Behind it was not the counterfactuals. 
there were lots of different plans, but it was the constraints. It was the fact that to pull something like that off and do all of the planning, you needed to be very rigorous in what you could actually adapt and and play with and what you couldn't. This is what I love about the book. I loved the last day that when you talked about Alyssa Milano, for example, you interviewed her, you did the work, you did the work here for The Economist, you interviewed on this, you covered the case, but then you wrapped the mental models and the frames around it, which is just fascinating. And you do this again with your co-authors throughout the book. But I was thinking about that case. And I was like, oh, well, I know it's the stakes are a lot higher, both on a global stage perspective, but also lives are on on the line here. But I was like, well, the amount of thinking and the amount of work that went into scenario planning, red teaming, what are the way they're thinking of from their perspective, counterfactuals, constraints, etc. And then I was thinking for our audience, that's actually what's needed in change programs as well. The, the thinking ahead, who are going to be the blockers, what's going to happen, who's going to be the person who actually holds up their mental rifle in a way and triggers some type of reaction and then botches the whole attempt to maybe run a change program within an organization. That's what I what I really find so fascinating about the book is take the principles of these stories and then apply them to your own change principles. Which gets me to the next question. And I'd love you to share these. There's three things. One is the minimal change principle that you talk about, which is so, so essential for any transformation program. The second is then OCAM's razor, which some people may be uh, familiar with. And then the third is how sometimes crises are the very thing a, an industry or an organization or an individual needs in order to lo unlock new potential. And you cover that brilliantly in the story of the Austrian wine scandal. So let me pick up before I answer that, let me pick up on something that you've said about, you know, who's going to pick up the mental rifle, uh, you know, uh, you know, and the element there is, which is, I think, a really intriguing, I hadn't thought about this, but intriguing way to conceptualize plans. Um, and maybe if we had thought about it and had the term that you've now given us uh, for that, the the rescue mission could have uh, avoided the casualty of its leader. And so I'm thinking back to uh, and something that happened at work uh, very recently in the last few weeks for me, in which I've had to tussle with uh, someone from a different department. I'm in a, in a position where I, part of my job is to tussle. And uh, my boss told me, um, said, don't take the bait. And I was really grateful to hear that. And the reason why is first, I was like, mm, yeah, of course, oh gosh, I'm such a like fool. I'm always taking the bait. Like I, that, that's like definitionally wave red meat at Ken Kukie and watch what happens. It's going to be a lot of fun. Sit back and he's going to really make a fool of himself. Career suicide. Okay. But so the second thing is first is that there's a recognition. It was bait. Like I was being that this, like what the person was saying was completely outrageous. It was a declaration of war and that this should we should not be in this environment internal politics on the other hand don't take it right so the don't take the bait metaphor here works with terms of whenever you advance an idea any innovator there's always going to be a critic and how how you handle your critic is really important you can either disarm them usually with a joke you can either combat them usually with your superior reasoning i would not recommend that you will always lose even if you win the argument the fact that you in the argument you're going to lose um ideally maybe there's a way just to ignore it right don't take the bait i'm in another sort of situation where there's a adverse sort of thing happening and i know that my strategy is to run down the clock if i can just have molasses feet institutionally throughout the organization, we can avoid making a really bad decision because we won't make the decision. The world is going to change and we're going to escape this problem. So it's not that I'm that I'm always taking the bait. I understand that there's times where I, I can be wise enough to step back and sort of, it's not about reframing, but it's, as you say, the mental rifle, 
how do you deal with the critics? I think that's really essential. And I think I'm really glad in that you picked up on this idea of what do you do with the guy who who is maybe actually not even aiming to shoot you. He's just picking up the rifle, right? He's just saluting, right? If you don't know, like, just... He's an itchy nose. He's... <laughs> yeah. I was just going to scratch my nose. But but just, can I just... Because I, I, I work... One of the one of the strands of my, my work portfolio is I executive coach. And it is so common, Ken, that that part of where you're the change maker or the innovator, there will be people the status quo by their very nature who will be out to get you because you threaten them so much and they will find ways to undermine you and sometimes and this has happened some of the great innovators i work with global companies and they've gone into hostage situations and they were ambushed by people who planned the ambush and then as you say they make the innovator look bad they basically foil their argument they they can't react in the moment their whole presentation is undermined and as a result so is the effort and they don't get a second chance it's such a pity so uh, yeah let, let's take a second on that it's so important i've been um i think a lot about that because we remember our failures more than our successes and because they hurt more because they're often unjust um and it's i have to i think that's why peer groups and and sort of sort of fellowship just more than just friendship is so important um in the sort of the entrepreneurs or the innovators journey in which you have like-minded people who you can just get your sort of strength from who can who can commiserate with you most entrepreneurs very successful ones belong to these sorts of sort of informal or formal groups. And I know I belong to a, a, a US Japan Foundation sort of organization, you know, sort of um, association and program that was intended to bring people together to sort of to support themselves as leaders as they move up the hierarchies of their organizations because they're going to face the same challenges and they're going to need support networks for that both among the americans the americans and the americans and the japanese and so and it's an incredibly um, important program for all of us um it's i guess the way that i had to think about it as a loser in these corporate battles as well has been to say to myself and i'd say this to then to the people that you're coaching um as sort of not to throw salt in the wounds but to give you strength which is to say did you think it was going to be easy? Like, did you really think you were going to walk into the room, come up with what we should do? And everyone was going to say, oh, yeah, that's great. Fantastic. You were so lucky you're here to save us. No, you're going to walk in and they are going to try to rip you to shreds. But they're going to do it in a way with a big smile on your face and make you look like a fool so that you stumble. Right. And like, did you really think it was going to be easy or like, You've got to just wise and up and recognize that you're going to be really careful. The best thing you can do, the thing that I've learned is like, no surprises. If you're going to go into, don't walk into the room and say things that people are hearing for the first time. Sometimes that, that happens, right? But if you can prevent that, like, shame on you if you don't prevent that. There was one, one instance in particular where I had with this, and of course, one of the reasons why you're in the room is there was someone probably like the CEO who loved the idea, but that's not good enough. If you if you're if your peers aren't with you or or the people who are below you in the hierarchy aren't with you, you're still going to have these problems. And so, just in fact, sometimes there's a curse of having you know the big wet kiss from the boss. Um, you ha that actually people are going to hate you before they even know the idea because you've short circuit the hierarchy because the boss loves you. You're the teacher's pet. So. It, it, the, so one of the ways in which you can avoid this using the concept of framing is this idea of mental rehearsals. And this is something that I now do very frequently that I learned about through reading the book, through writing the book. The great athletes and great business leaders, among others, and great politicians typically use this idea of creative visualizations or mental rehearsals. There's lots of different terms for it. Um, classic example of that is Michael Phelps when he was swimming, where 
um, or um, a, a, a ski jumper, where they will do, or actually I'll say Israeli fighter pilots, because they do this as well, a lot of, a lot of um, very serious people in positions of high performance or responsibility use this as a technique in a very structured way in which they think through what's going to happen very deliberately for hours on end, playing it in the scenario in their minds and how they would respond to anything that's unpredictable. And the reason why is that when it's showtime and they have to compete or they, you know, or they have to, you know, they're in combat, they have the confidence of having done something tens of thousands of times rather than just once. A surgeon might do this where in tricky surgery in which they do mental rehearsals. But interestingly, CEOs do that where they go into the boardroom without the board, you know, days before and start giving their speech or just thinking through their speech, even if they're not talking out loud, so they can imagine what's going to happen. They can imagine the interactions. They can imagine the joke that they'll say if they get a, a complaint by the person who's always the grumpy guy in the room to then have a little bit of laughter before he actually responsibly answers the question. So the, the way to, to sort of neuter situations like that, the people who, you know, who sort of take aim at you is through, I, I think through first doing the preparation beforehand. Uh, there's a Japanese term for it, uh, nemiwashi, I think of sort of going around the roots. Um, which is the way that they do it in Japan, which is a very consensus-based culture, or through, which is sort of talking to people beforehand, basically, and getting them on board. Even if they're gonna, there's going to be a combat, you could even disarm it by saying, you know, there's a lot of, there's a variety of view, views around the room about this idea, right? And that will be a way to acknowledge that there's, there's dissensus and not consensus. But also it's about mental rehearsals. And that's really important because that's a part of framing. It's about counterfactuals. It's about thinking about how things might unfold and adapting what you're going to do based on how the different ways in which the world can unfold. Oh man, beautiful, beautiful. I'm so, so glad. I'm so grateful that you addressed this because also it is so damaging for many people's mental health. Like one of the things that happened, I worked in an organization where I was head of innovation and the status quo absolutely set out to do this. I was ambushed many, many times. But I was very, very lucky because I had a career in sport and that teaches you. I mean, you're you're basically going through this every week when you play a game or whatever. And I had the mental strength and I, I never thought of it until recently. A guy who worked there with me said he saw the brilliant series about Theranos, the dropout and Elizabeth Holmes, the big scandal of Theranos scandal. And in it, I don't know if you've seen it, but there's a character played by Stephen Fry and he's a scientist and he calls out that there's an issue. And then he gets put out to Siberia here in the organization and he's all his power is stripped from him. And that often happens, change makers and organizations, but he doesn't have the mental strength in the story. And it really, really touched a string for me. It, it really made me go, oh my God, there's so many people who listen to this show. And, and please, if you do listen to this show, take strength from that point that it's not your fault, but there's a lot of things that need to be done. You need to do a hell of a lot of work to change the status quo. It is not going to give up without this massive, massive fight. And Ken, you did a magnificent job explaining it there. So thank you so much. Can I build on what I said and what you've just said, just a little bit more on it? I don't want to sort of over egg the pudding. But uh, in, a, in the book, we actually do talk about this in a different context, which is what we call the corporate Cassandra. Now, the myth of Cassandra is this, the beautiful daughter of King Priam, uh, and Apollo is, you know, adores. And so to win over her favors, he gives her this gift of prophecy. But when she spurs her his advances, uh, he, you know, a, a divine gift cannot be revoked. So he curses her and he curses her that she's unable to communicate what she sees. She can predict and foretell the fall of Troy, but she screams into the wind in a language that no one understands and no one hears her and they all think her mad. Okay. That sounds like an ordinary day in a Fortune 500 company, right? In which there's always some person, right, often not the, the most senior in the hierarchy, who can see the future and is trying to tell everyone 
whether it's at AT AT&T, or it's at Yahoo, or it's at BT, or it's at Nokia, right? This is what's going to happen unless we respond, and we better get our act in gear, we better do it. And either they can't understand her or him, or they don't want to. Now, in his in his in his corporate memoir, uh, his, his autobiography, uh, Andy Grove, the founder of Intel, devoted an entire chapter to what he called the corporate Cassandras, because he looked out for these people because he felt them to be the most important people in the organizations because he wanted to hear what they had to say so that he could calibrate their business strategy and take into account their way of seeing the world, the way that they frame the world differently, and what they're trying to say, where the rest of the organization, like corporate antibodies, are trying to destroy and smother that person. He's like, no, no, no. He he finds them prized. He looks out for them. Ed Catmull, in his corporate biography, Creativity Inc., Ed Catmull is the the founder and former CEO of Pixar, says that actually these Cassandras are critical because the person who is cursed is not the individual, but the organization, because if the organization can't hear it, it's a big problem. So he too refers to the Cassandras and why they're so important in terms of how to reimagine the business and see things that other people don't see. So as a leader, we have to find a way to embolden the Cassandras, to get them to speak out so we can actually hear it. We need to reward reward it. And even if it's wrong, we need to, or, or, or we have a good reason why we don't think it, it has purchase on the situation, we need to still be grateful for it and show the person as well as, more importantly, the rest of the team that we're grateful for it. Because if we don't, shame on us, because then we're going to be missing information that's going to be crucial. The, the, the basic feature of liberalism, which is actually the, the basic undergirding of the entire book of framing, the idea of pluralism, is that nobody has the answer. Right, that that altogether we probably do have the answers, but we don't individually have the answer. So it's wrong to think that our frame and our way of seeing the world is the only one that exists or is the best one. The the the, the best strategy in times of change is that we can take in inputs from other people and that we can modify our frames so that it's a better fit for the circumstances that we're in. And so hence it's so important that we are that we recognize with some humility the frames that we have and bring in other people's frames to adapt it and to tailor it and to fix it into our own. Beautiful, man. This is this is awesome. This show just went in a totally different level that I hadn't pre- predicted, and I'm so so happy because th- this is you mentioned about the the groups. I I run a group called Change Makers Anonymous for that exact reason that it's a support group because people feel so oftentimes ostracized or they feel they're made broken. They're I call it corporate gaslighting. They're gaslit to make think them think they're the problem so they'll leave most of the time because they are the helpful cassandras and most leaders have mind guards around them protecting them from these people like i i I, again i mentioned about the coaching some people aren't allowed to have an audience with the ceo for the reason you said because they have to go through the hierarchy and oftentimes the message gets filtered and changed and you know you can't say that and you can't say that you'll get him in trouble or her in trouble like it's it's disastrous for people so i know how difficult it is and as you said it was never going to be easy it's part of the job but i mentioned there about getting back to we we said back to the book which is uh, again magnificent we're, we're by the way just for our audience here we're not we're only on like chapter three four <laughs> we've kind of melded them together and i i highly recommend reading the book again if you get it make sure you leave an amazon review it really helps the author as well the authors in this case to boost the algorithm but one of the things was minimal change principle which is really important again for this change mission or odyssey for many people the second was ocam's razor and the third i i love it because Oftentimes, many people have crises in their lives, and they think it's the end of the road. And I know how difficult it is in that moment. But sometimes it unlocks some potential or some under other direction, and puts them on a totally better path. And it doesn't feel like it in the moment. And I, I know that I've been there, but it can. And the Austrian wine scandal was one of those examples. Yeah. So let me so 
let's start with with Occam's razor, uh, which is the simplicity principle. And Occam's razor is a sort of um, theory from the Earl of Occam from about around the 1200s or so. And it's it's a bit apocryphal of how he got to it and, and that it was whether it's his or not, and there's antecedents to it. But the simple idea is this, that to explain any phenomenon, always go with the simplest answer, not the most complex. Now, as a rule of thumb, that turns out to be um, wickedly important because the more complex something is, the more it's likely to be wrong because it relies on so many different moving parts. I'm talking about an explanation of the world. Example of what we talked about um, uh, in our first podcast of the um, heliocentric and geocentric theory of the universe in which does the earth revolve around the sun or the sun around the earth. If the earth is at the center, you can have plot planetary motions, but they all have these weird, radically peculiar orbits and these paths in which they make these little epicycles and go in these retrograde motions. Take the Earth and you make it one of many planets rather than the center of the universe, and suddenly it just looks like circles. They're elliptical, but you get the idea. And the Copernican map did that. And Occam's razor is almost definitionally robust when it comes to something like trying to understand planetary motion. If you can, if you can choose the simpler option, choose it. And so that's useful in, in all different areas of life. Um, there's an aphorism in the in the sciences that your model is not complete when you've finished adding all the different elements to it. Your model is complete when you've pulled out everything from it that you don't need. So it's the bare essence. Okay. So the minimal change principle is this idea that when you're trying to play with constraints and trying to modify a frame, don't go for the biggest change possible. Go for the smallest change. And the reason why is, is sort of like the legal principle of stare decisis, stay the decision, which is try to be as constant as possible. If we, if there were, if we have this frame and we found it useful before, there's probably elements to it that are useful to keep. And we don't want to throw things out wholesale because we risk throwing up the baby with the bathwater. Instead, we just want to throw out the bathwater. If you will, try to have the smallest change you possibly can, not the biggest. And that also might win acceptance to an idea because you're not asking, say, the company to do something completely different. For example, I'm a beverage company and I want to you know, start selling cupcakes, right? But you want to just say, hey, I'm a beverage company and I, or beverage company and I don't want to start selling, you know, to be more nutritious, baby carrots. I'm a beverage company and I just want to now start selling bottled water in addition to my fizzy drinks, right? That would be sort of, if you will, sort of the minimal change. It turns out it's a, it's a, it's a really good principle as well, and it tends to help people when they're trying to frame, not look for these big changes, these revolutions, but for these small permutations, these small evolutions. Now, um, crises are really useful for situations to force changes like this. And the reason why is um, we hit a rock bottom and we are no longer tied to the status quo, and we have to do something different. And so we have a license to act that we otherwise don't have, and we have now the willpower and momentum to do so, and we probably take people on. The Austrian wine scandal uh, in the 1980s was, a, was an example of that, where if you add a, a chemical to, uh, to wine, which is basically similar to a compound that's an antifreeze, so People called it the antifreeze scandal, that it will sweeten the wine and it'll take away some of the, the bitter taste to it, and it'll it'll give it a nice little color and a smoothness to it. In low quantities, it's safe, in larger quantities, it's not. But nevertheless, the idea that people could be ant adding antifreeze to wine is a bad look. Austrian wine had typically been cheap wine, particularly compared to Germany and elsewhere. And so this was a way to improve the taste of the wine and to increase sales and, 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 and profits and all of that. So this was a crisis for the Austrian wine industry because now uh, what you had were countries around the world literally banning the import of Austrian wine and dumping it, and now no one wants to buy it. And it could be the end of the Austrian wine industry, and what they'd have to do is plant a different crop. That's one possibility. Maybe sell grapes rather than turn it into wine. That could be another turn to vinegar, like whatever. However, there was some thoughtful people who had a different idea, and they realized, well, wait a minute. Uh, this is at a time when a lot of producers, one of the producers committed suicide because he was so implicated in the scandal. 
um, uh, others were being forced out of business, going bankrupt. And so you'd also a generational shift where younger people were taking on their family farms. And the young vintners thought, well, actually, what we need to do is create a very rigorous regulatory regime around it so people know that it's certified. So what we will do is we will number every bottle. Now that you're numbering every bottle, the bottle has a maybe, if you will, a little bit more prestige because it sort of has a has a sort of a, a it, it's it's not just any old thing. It's something that's been sort of closely sort of scrutinized as being of of a certain quality. So because they also had lower volumes, they were no longer going for cheap wine. They were going for better wine. They were taking the grapes that were of mediocre quality and throwing them out and using them for other processes, maybe grape juice, and using only better grapes. So now they had better wine. They had very nice bottles. They changed the label so that it was a beautiful label. And now what they were doing is they were taking a product that had been a cheap product and they're turning it into a premium product. Okay. What they then did was they actually even changed the environment of the wineries to show that people could come in and see that they're not actually doing anything bad with it. They created environments so that tourists can come in and or just members of the public could see it. But if you're going to create your cellar and your, your, your wine producing area in a way that you can have outsiders look at it, you might as well have a and b next door. And you might as well have a nice restaurant to it. And you could have nice wine tastings with interesting local cheeses. And you can have architects build very nice um, sort of, you know, little um, outposts in the fields where you could actually bring people in. And then they could see it so you can have a whole sort of day at the winery to understand how things work and then stay overnight having have a great meal nearby. And that's exactly what they did. So the Austrian wine industry in the space of about 10 to 20 years went from being almost at the brink of bankruptcy and never being able to sell another drop of, of liquid again to turning it into a very high-end premium product that had a real touristic um, and beautiful artistic and, and aesthetic quality to it. And that turned Austrian wines into a lovely uh, wine and, and, the, and the wineries themselves into places of prestige a way of reframing it. But if you think about it, at the end, it was a minimal change. They still were in the wine business. They just shifted from a cheap product to a premium product. And they could make that switch with the minimal change. And that is the point. Another analogy for organizations, for changing organizations. Sometimes you have to go through the tough times in order to get to the good times once again. Ken, absolute pleasure talking to you right on time man we finished right, right on time perfect you're an absolute pro i loved the riff on the cha the challenges because it's people will look at you successful author with the economist etc and they're going to go oh it's different for him and oftentimes you get that you get that in this uh, in in any change or transformation role or innovation role but it's not it's the same principle it's the same pattern and I'm so grateful that you you did that, you shared that with our audience, because it's so important. And I'm sure it's going to reach somebody and really touch them and go, ah, and, and encourage so many. So for that, above everything else, and I'm so grateful for you anyway, spending so much time with us. I'm so, so grateful. Yeah, it's my pleasure. These are great questions. And it's a great audience. And the themes are fantastic and really need to be better understood. So I'm really grateful and i appreciate the fact that we could have this conversation we could share these ideas with a wider audience author of framers make better decisions in the age of big data kenneth kukier thank you for joining us thank aiden thank you very much I'm so pleased to be here just a reminder this show is brought to you by zai boldly transforming the future of financial services with a suite of embedded products and services enabling businesses to manage multiple payment workflows and move funds with ease Check out Zai at hellozai.com and I'll see you very soon.